Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. had the show and decided that we needed an area that was remote from the rest of the show for the horses so we didn't get them entangled with all the mechanized machinery and uh, so I think it was in 88 we decided to build the barn and uh, and everything mushroom from there but uh, uh, several of us traveled around and looked at old barns and this is not a copy of any particular one, but a composite of probably about four barns that we looked at. And we liked the idea of a, a walk-in loft so people could get in the loft as well as the lower part of the barn. And uh, then, of course, as soon as we had a barn, why then so we have to have a house. And so then I think it was in 90 that uh, we built the house and the house was uh, that was copied after a Sears Roebuck house back in the early, you could buy a package house through Sears Roebuck and uh, we again uh, looked at many of them and uh, patterned it after a Sears Roebuck house. So that was done in 90 and we slowly added. This little building we're standing in now is the oldest building. This was on the property, not here, but another uh, place and if you examine it, it's built with square nails, which tells us it's prior to 1880. Because it was in the 1880s that they figured out how to make uh, round nails and not, not square ones. So uh, we've tried to keep this, this is the only, or the oldest building on the grounds that's uh, square. And we, I always refer to it as the square nail building. <laughs> that's, the, that's the way we uh, determine it. Did you move it as one unit, or did you dismantle it? And no, we picked it up as it is, and and then built a foundation for it. And uh, was it a blacksmith shop originally? No, I think uh, it served several purposes. See the big door in the front. Why that wasn't there? We cut that out to make it usable. Uh, I think it was a granary and a few other things, and uh, and we found a few artifacts that were kind of interesting that have been left in there from way back in the 1800s. But it stood up in the trees up in the north part of the grounds. That was uh, that's how this developed, and we had a couple of fellows with good vision. Uh, I know before we even built uh, a thing here, why one of the old timers stood up on the railroad tracks and kind of put his thumbs in his overalls and said, now you see if we put the barn in the hillside there, a house could go over there. And, and he had it all in his mind and I never forgot that as we developed the farm site. And I think we have a very nice setting here. A very beautiful view when you stand up by the railroad tracks and look down this way. And we tried to keep it as close to a turn of the century uh, farm as we can. You know, we have another farm site on the west side of the grounds, it's called the 30s farm site. And they go a little more modern, see. But this one is, uh, is done to, to try to represent the turn of the century. And we've kind of kept the electricity down to a minimum so that it would be more like, uh, like an original. So uh, it's been a, it was a fun project, and uh, now I've kind of passed it on to a bunch of the younger people, and uh, and they've taken over real well. And great show, and uh, I think we bring a lot of history back, and that's our idea is to let the young people see what it was like back in the in the early days. And 
I'm no kid anymore either. I'm 83 now, so <laughs> so I lived in a lot of the, or not the turn of the century, but I earned lived before the electricity on the farm and so forth. So it's, uh, it's been a fun fun project over the years, and we think it, we think we're done, and then every year we add something more. It seems to just grow and grow. I guess I was president in the 80s. And we thought we'd have bought maxed out then, but that that wasn't true at all. <laughs> it just keeps growing, and, uh, and it's a great place for people to old timers to come and bring their grandkids and tell them how how they lived back in the in the early days, you know. Was a treadle? Was a treadle? This, is, this yeah. is a treadle. It's a Davis vertical feed made by the Davis Sewing Machine Company in about 1900. The one sitting in front of Paul. Is made by an American Sewing Machine Company in about 1880. Not sure on the date on it, but that's about what it would be. And that's powered by pulling the turn of the wheel. Yeah. And this one is from 1907. That one, the date, we're sure on it. And it was made in Kilbuey, Scotland. And it it still still is nice. It's, oh, it's a nice machine. It's, Hasn't been used a whole lot, I don't think. Wow. What treasures? I think in, in that era, I think a lot of people bought a machine and then then they discovered electric and then they thought, well, we'll just stick that one in the closet and get another one. <laughs> and probably the treadle machines came out after the, the turning the wheels? It's, it's all, the all about the same, same time. All about the same time period. And it seems like that would be a lot easier because you'd have a hand, both hands free. Yeah. It, 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 it was, it, and it was faster, but the hand cranks were generally, you generally find them out east more where they had small houses and row houses and stuff, but they didn't have room for a big treadle. And you get out west here where we had big farmhouses, we had big houses in town. There was always room on a wall someplace to set a treadle. Um, I prefer the treadles because they are faster. But if I'm going to do intricate piecing or just want a relaxing afternoon, the hand crank's great in the backyard. And I think that's why a lot of them got used as much as they did, because they could take them outside. And is that a little bit more precise control, too, when you're turning the cranks a little bit? Maybe? Yeah. So that's you where can, you might like it for the intricate work? You can stop right there. Right. It's the same with a treadle, though. If, if you're going... Sure. Sure. Can you I get guess. it again for me? Sure. If, and this one just so is just wonderful. It's, it will tell a straight, straight line almost all day long without yeah. hardly touching. We think we're really clever today with the machines we make, but these are amazing, aren't they? They're actually better than most machines today. I bought an electric a couple years ago that because I was not capable of doing this for a couple months in the winter and I hate the thing and I don't use it because I'd rather sit down and do this. Um, have it's more like a finely tuned watch. I mean, so, yeah. So precision. Well, and, and you get these set and you can sew for a week, every single day for a week and never have to change attention, never have to, other than to fill a bobbin or get a new spool of thread, that's about all you do to them.
what was this engine used for? And a line shaft in the sheet metal factory out in Nevada, Missouri. Norman Sheet Metal Factory. So it would run 100 machines? Probably. Yep. yep. You just belt it up to a line shaft on the other side. Curing equipment, all the stamping equipment. Used to stamp on the ceiling tiles right now. Built in 1903, went, went to the World's Fair in 1904, and then I went to the sheet metal factory after that and ran 50 plus years. It must have been a job getting it here. If I remember right, I think it was five semi loads. I was quite young when, when we first brought it over. They went down and got it in uh, 75, I believe we brought it back in 1976. It was up and running here. And then in 1977, we put the building around. And in 99, we quit belting it. We used to belt it. And then in 99, we went with the starting engine on the other side. Alex, the left-hand horse is 16, and Bob, the right-hand horse, is 8. Both geldings? Yep, both Pertron geldings. Did you raise them? Uh, nope. Nope. You bought them broke? Yep. What do you do with them? Uh, Besides this? Just play around with them in the yard. Used to run a carriage business, but uh, just have a team around to kind of play around with them. So. They're pretty quiet. They're standing yeah. pretty good for you. I've seen a lot of miles, so. Okay. This is a hay press uh, used for making hay bales, straw bales, or hay bales. One man stands on top of the platform and presses hay, hay with a pitchfork down into the chamber. And as the horse walks around, there's a plunger that'll advance and then it over centers and comes back. And you got two guys, one on each side, that will tie the bales. It's supposed to be a wire tie bale, but we can't get wire anymore, so we're using twine. You see we have boards there that will drop in every so often to determine the length of the bale. And it, it makes, it plunges twice per revolution. You can see right here it's about ready to snap over and the horse has to walk over the pole. And 
you know, one guy can sit on there. Most of the time, the horses will get used to it and they'll just keep going round and round on their own. How long have you had this boring machine? Uh, this is our second year using it. We've, we've had it for probably 10, 15 years. Then a gentleman from California saw it a couple years ago and he wanted to restore it for us. So he restored it over last summer and then last fall was the first time we used it. Uh, he built around 1915. It takes about two guys to run it and then one guy to run the horse. And the whole, whole top turns, you know, so cables and everything, and you got to keep putting shafts on. You get about three and a half feet of travel each time. Uh, and then there's gear you can engage to winch the bucket back up when it's full, and then you see on top there's a hook we can swing around and dump the dirt out on the ground when it's full. This is a Woodbury horsepower. Uh, five teams of horses will go on here and as they turn there's you can see all the gearing inside and it runs the tumbler shaft and we're powering our uh, separator with this and they would power various equipment I guess back you know in the, in the day and so is this a transmission yep uh, this was made originally the tumbler shaft would go directly up to the thrashing machine but we don't have the correct gearbox and can't find one. So we're, we've got a clutch in here so we can start the horses and then engage the transmission to start the belt. So it's not quite authentic here, but it's what we have to work with and it works pretty well. Here we have a Red River Special hand feed thrashing machine. It's built around 1900 and this is all original condition yet. Uh, it's been very well taken care of and we had to do a little repair work here and there, but it, most of the time we thrash oats with it, but we're gonna have to thrash wheat this year. Our torrential rainfalls kind of hammered our oats in the ground.
my dad started bringing me and my brother out here when we were just kids. I was five. Uh, the show was actually pretty small. You know, everything was within the train tracks. Um, my dad bought me my first team of Belgian Colts when I was 12. And that's kind of how I always loved horses, but once I got attached to the big heavy horses, just fell in love. Um, they started out here in about 1988 with draft horses, just doing some field work, just plowing and disking and just kind of having fun. Uh, the year after that, they decided they wanted to build a barn and a house and kind of get this area started and going more. Uh, probably one of my best memories is uh, it rained for about three days out here and uh, we hooked a team of Belgian onto a car. Lady didn't even take it out of park. She didn't even realize that she should take it and put it in neutral so we could help pull her out. But uh, this place has really grown. We buy in corn, we buy in wheat, we disc, we plow. We have uh, the five big horses on the thrasher, which really draws a crowd. Uh, it's just amazing to see the people come out and they're just amazed of how, these, how big these horses are, how gentle their nature is. Uh, the people are great. You know, and you get people you haven't seen for an entire year and it's like you just talked to them yesterday. They're your best friends. They, you know, they'll buy you a donut or back and you go back to camp and they ask you over for dinner. It's, it's, just, it's almost like a big family. It's just so enjoyable. It's unbelievable. We welcome teams all the time. We're always willing to just contact the association or anybody in the horse area. I'm glad to give you information and invite you out. You can come for a day, you can come for two days, you can come for four. It doesn't matter to us. We just Love to have the big horses out here working and showing the people how much work and what it was used to really be like to farm. You contact anybody there, they will find somebody down from the horse area uh, and gladly get you the information. They also have a Facebook page. Same thing, Western Minnesota Steam Thrashers Union. You can go on there and look. Yep, uh, we get mules, Belgians, Pertrons. We usually get a team of Clydesdales. Uh, we have some quarter horse teams. We got pony rides. I mean, if you if you can't come out here and enjoy the day, you, if you gotta love horses. But even if you don't, I I guarantee you'll enjoy it. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of Back to the Land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.